Welcome to this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic. Today we're going to be dissecting a concept that has appeared and reappeared in social media news feeds recently, where the U.S. Air Force claims to be investigating how to deliver logistical supplies anywhere on Earth using rocket technology in less than an hour, and they want to have this in place by 2022. This is actually recycled nonsense that comes up every so often. Originally, SpaceX put this forward in 2019, wanting to work with the U.S. Army to develop such a system using Starship. It came out again last fall in October of 2020, again mentioning SpaceX and Starship. But this June 2021 Air Force announcement seems to have opened it up somewhat for others to bid competitively on for consideration. Because the ship in their drawing looks absolutely nothing like a SpaceX Starship. The debate hit Twitter when this article started making its way around, and some sycophant channels lined up to ooh and ah about how brilliant the Air Force must be to come up with such a great idea. Today, we're going to show you that the Air Force needs to hire better engineers, and they can send the ones they have now overseas somewhere, where they can be of some use scrubbing pots or finding landmines. Here's the scenario. For whatever reason, some forward area action is in desperate need of resupply. The graphic used in the news release is a bunch of military ambulances driving away from what appears to be a landed rocket supply ship, so let's assume it's humanitarian aid in a natural disaster zone. While we're on this frame, take a quick note of the general design of the rocket, and pay attention to the fact that it has no access hatch. To be clear, this paradigm is a variation of the nonsensical point-to-point -point human transport system floated by Musk in 2017, and again repeated by his ventriloquist dummy Gwen Shotwell in 2018. We eviscerated the human transport model in episode 8. Eight episodes later, we're going to do the same thing with this dry goods delivery system. And we're going to do it under the assumption that they'll use Starship, that it works perfectly, in fact exactly as Musk promises it will, and we're going to use the U.S. launch facilities at Vandenberg, California as the base of operations. What's unique about Vandenberg is that it is a former Air Force base with a full runway system that has also hosted rocket launches dating back to 1958, and it has recently been renamed the Vandenberg Space Force Base, which is now headquarters to Space Launch Delta 30 and all the attached squadrons. On Google Maps, we can see the layout of the base, the location of the hangars, the location of the runways, and the location of the space launch facilities. Vandenberg hosts a large number of launch facilities, some of which have been deactivated, along with test facilities for ICBMs. Now, Google Maps is great for showing details just about everywhere else, but here it's lacking. Wikipedia, on the other hand, is kind enough to provide the exact coordinates for each of those sites. So we'll just point out the half dozen active space launch complexes. Space Complex 2 West is used for Firefly Alpha launches, it's located here. Atlas V launches happen at SLC-3 East, as they have since 2008. Falcon 9 launches use SLC-4 East, and they were covered at SLC-4 West, also known as LZ-4. SLC-6 is home to Delta IV launches for polar orbits. Minotaurs use SLC-8, and Taurus rockets launch from Launch Complex 576 East. All of these launch complexes are located a fair distance away from any other set of structures, just in case. So let's play out a disaster scenario on the west coast of South America. The rocket won't be able to fly over land, so we'll play fair, since launching an unauthorized rocket over any country could be considered an act of war. Peru is on the west coast, and they have a lot of earthquakes in Peru. So let's say they've had a major earthquake in Lima, and they need urgent medical supplies. We'll ignore the fact that there are other American military bases throughout South America within easy flight times of Lima, and we're going to send the supplies from Vandenberg. The Boeing C-17 transport plane is specifically mentioned in the Air Force press release as having the type of payload that they want to be able to deliver within an hour by rocket. So what we are going to do is compare the logistics of using that aircraft from that base against the logistics of using a Starship from that same point. So the call comes in. Lima provides a manifest of what they need, and pickers head off to the hangars to prepare pallets of supplies. At the same time, the C-17 pilots start checking over their aircraft, then move it into position on the tarmac closest to the provisions hangars, then get to work filing their flight plan. Maintenance crews refuel the aircraft, and once the pallets are wrapped up by the warehousing crew, they're taken by forklift or truck right up to the aft ramp of the C-17, where crews roll it into position on the floor and lock it into place. These pallets can be stacked as high as headroom allows, and a convoy of forklifts or trucks can line up to drop their loads into the aircraft. As soon as the aft hatch is sealed, the plane can taxi to the runway and head out to the drop zone. 
Refueling the craft is a quick stop at a fuel depot somewhere along the line, or it can be done in the air using an aircraft such as the KC-135 Stratotanker, as they did in this clip. And the best part about using this vehicle is that if the supplies are needed in an area that has no runway to land on, the C-17 can open the tailgate and drop the supplies right into the affected area using parachutes. Doesn't even have to land. With the same method, they could deliver to several different drop zones along the same flight. Once those deliveries are complete, turn the craft around, head for home. Mission accomplished. Compare this sweet efficiency to the rocket concept. Call comes in, provisions crew starts putting the pallets of supplies together, and the forklift operators take the pallets out to the... Where's the rocket? Well, it's not going to be parked right in the middle of an airbase now, is it? There's a reason why these launch pads are kilometers away from the nearest base buildings. Look in these photos and you're not seeing warehousers or hangars, are you? So instead of loading the pallets directly into the aircraft, they'll be loaded into trucks and hauled to the rocket's launch site. And then, they'll have to be unloaded by another forklift operator and taken to the rocket hatch. Except the rocket hatch isn't at ground level, is it? Well, this machine in the photo apparently doesn't have any hatch at all. On the Starship, it's about 100 feet in the air, that's 30 meters for the rest of the world, if they are launching the machine without the benefit of the super heavy booster. If the rocket needs that extra horsepower to launch, the hatch will be about 100 meters in the air. This is the floor plan of the C-17 cargo hold, just over 5 meters wide to the squared off edges of the rounded fuselage. The floor itself is a rectangle measuring 25 meters long and 5 and a quarter meters wide. The clearance at the ramp is 4 and a half meters. This is the floor plan of a Starship deck, to scale. It's wider than the floor plan of the C-17 at 8 meters to the inner walls, but each of the floors above the hatch is going to be shaped like a donut to allow materials to pass upward to the top deck. After the cargo is lifted from the ground to enter the ship on the bottom pressurized cargo deck, it still has up to 20 more meters to go inside the craft, and the size of the pallet will be determined by the size of the elevator up the center of the ship going between floors. The entire operation comes down to the speed of two different elevators. Also, those decks and the elevator and any other equipment will cut into the 100-ton payload ability of the vehicle. Everything inside the fairing will have to max out at 100 tons. Let's say instead of random pallets, they're using a standard shipping crate often referred to as a D-container. These are rigid containers that can be stacked up to 4 units high. They are roughly 1.25 cubic meters, measuring 1 by 1 by 1 and a quarter, and they've got a capacity of 1 imperial ton, or around 907 kilos. The C-17 would be able to take these containers, pack them 4 wide across the craft, stack them 4 high to the ceiling, and have them 25 rows deep. That's 400 units in the hold. On Starship or something similar, that's not going to be the case. First off, since there's no opportunity for machinery to operate inside the vehicle during the loadup, everything is going to have to be unstacked and single story, which means more deck heads and more loss of payload. The access port, if it's round, will have to accommodate the dimensions of the crate. So a squared off hole might be more practical, and we'll use that exact crate measurements as the portal size, not counting for the machinery required to operate the elevator. With the rounded walls, packing this cylinder will be a tricky task, with a lot of wasted space. They'll have to play around a bit with the configuration. If they do it this way, keeping everything in a squared off pattern, they can fit about 24 per level. Placing them this way with a ring around the outside and a squared off pattern in the middle, they can get 27 per level. We'll split the difference at 25, which means they would require 16 levels to get to the same capacity as the C-17. Considering the deckheads would have to be solid enough to hold the weight of up to 25 tons per level, which will occupy volume and take away from the payload capacity, and the fact that this vehicle has a tapered nose, that's simply not possible. And then these materials need to be secured in place in such a way that it simply cannot move. Any movement in the load during launch, and it'll break apart the rocket. Once everything is squared away and they seal the hatch and evacuate the launch pad, then they can start fueling the craft. We've gone over this before. Fueling time on a space shuttle for the 630 tons of LOX and 106 tons of liquid hydrogen in the yellow tank took just under 3 hours to fill. Starship needs 1200 tons of propellant for the first stage alone, so almost double that time, and another 3400 tons if they need to use the booster to launch with. This is definitely going to take a while, and with cryo propellants they are definitely not going to be able to just fuel up the craft and let it sit there until it's needed. Meanwhile, since this craft would likely not have a bridge crew, programmers and flight specialists would have to quickly come up with a flight plan and contingencies, programming the flight so it can conduct the delivery autonomously, including finding a suitable place to touch down somewhere near the disaster zone. 
So they're all loaded up, gassed up, uploaded, and just as they're ready to launch, someone breaches the TFR zone and kills the countdown. You're launching a rocket. TFRs are still going to be required for the rocket launch, which will require FAA approval and monitoring. Then after the zone is cleared, the rocket will take off. Travel time to Lima from Vandenberg would be somewhere in the neighborhood of half an hour. Then what? Well, the rocket has to land safely, first of all, so they'll have to find a suitable level landing site on short notice. Once the rocket touches down, ground crews that were staying well clear will come into the landing zone to secure the craft and open the hatch, which again is 10 stories in the air. But at the receiving end, they won't have external elevators and whatnot. They will have to unload the rocket container by container, floor by floor, load the supplies on the crane platform, lower the platform to the ground, unload the platform, retrieve the platform, and repeat until done. How much weight do you think that four-point cable crane can hold and lift? Keeping in mind, it is outside the footprint of the vehicle and affecting the center of gravity of that vehicle that will become lighter and lighter for each consecutive load. Not to mention, if all the fuel has been used up, this vehicle is going to be extremely top-heavy as it is. Once all those containers are down at ground level, they need to get packed into the waiting trucks that you see in those CGIs and then transported to where they're needed. After the deliveries are made, when it's all said and done, the rocket will take off and head back home, right? No, that sucker is staying right where it is. Pretty much guaranteed it won't have enough fuel to take off on a return trajectory. And unless it landed at another airbase with refueling facilities with technicians capable of refurbishing the craft to flight status, it's not going anywhere. So they'll have this spacecraft sitting in the middle of whatever disaster zone it landed in until something else happens to it and it falls over or explodes. Either way, this becomes an additional hazard to the area. Truly, this concept is insane. Delivering materials to the other side of the planet by rocket is not only a ridiculous concept, it will never work as pictured. There is no possible scenario where this works better than delivering goods by military aircraft from any of the 800 US military installations located around the world. If something happened in Lima, they can fly from any base in Central or South America or Guantanamo Bay or Aruba, all of them within easy reach of the C-17's flight range. And the only reason why we used the Boeing C-17 as the comparison craft was because that was the one mentioned in the Air Force article. But a single Lockheed Martin C-5M Super Galaxy carries a maximum payload of 129 metric tons with a range of 7,000 nautical miles or about 13,000 kilometers using a mere 150 tons of fuel that has a cruising speed of 830 kilometers per hour. Less than four hours after taking off from the co-op base that they have in Aruba 2800 kilometers away, they would be landing at Lima, Peru with their tanks 80% full for the return flight home. They could, in fact, make two round trips on the same fuel load. And this gargantuan plane could haul the same materials payload as the C-17, along with two full-sized helicopters to distribute the supplies with pinpoint accuracy. Cost per vehicle, $100 million for something you can fly over and over and over again, versus whatever it costs for the Starship and its single-use purpose, along with all the logistical nightmares that system has wrapped into it. And remember, the US has a network throughout the world of bases for their various armed forces branches. If one is too far away, there's always another one to call on that can get there quicker. Anywhere in Africa, anywhere in Asia, anywhere in Europe, they've pretty much got the globe covered which just makes the thought of rocket delivery that much more ridiculous. And if that somehow wasn't good enough, there are carrier groups located around the world as well. Just to wrap this up, we were getting into a Twitter debate with Scott Manley about this, since he posted that article on his profile, and we were wondering how he could possibly think this is a good idea, or how it would even be technically feasible. With his typical Scottish haughtiness, he queried us this, are we saying that we have a better understanding of what the Air Force needs than the Air Force? So to paraphrase the question in light of our investigation, do we think we have a better grasp on reality than the DAF SOBs from the AFR lab who forgot to put an egress port on an ICBM CGI they want to use to deliver EMS supplies and MREs as requested for FDR, which will require a completely different SOP from the FAA and the DOD than will the C-17s or the C-5Ms in order to avoid an RUD or LOV, including issuance of TFRs and NOTAMs surrounding the LZ of the MOD in a disaster zone. Yes, yes we do. And if the DOD or AFR people give this video a view, we just saved the US taxpayer about $50 million. If not, once these rocket scientists start looking into it, they'll likely find out this is not the first time the federal government has considered this concept. 
Just like any other original idea Musk or SpaceX comes up with, if you dig deep enough into the NASA or the comic book archives, you'll find out they're not that original at all. Thanks for tuning into this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic. Hopefully this concept is given all the care and attention it deserves by the Air Force, which is precisely none. Completely useless concept, and the fact that people can't see through this level of scientific illiteracy is as humorous as it is disappointing. Just our opinion, but everybody should know better, or at least know how to break down the numbers as we've done here, and work it out for themselves. We are ticking down to our first year anniversary, and all of our numbers continue to climb. We are really hoping to hit that magic 20,000 subs by July 1st, but we're going to need your help. Give the video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, post it on your social media links, and make sure you're subscribed so that you'll know when the Common Sense Skeptic returns.